Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I am joined with the author and scholar Gordon Campbell. Gordon Campbell is a professor in Renaissance Studies at the University of Leicester and is a fellow of the British Academy. He has authored and edited many books for Oxford University Press, including the Oxford Dictionary of the Renaissance, Renaissance Art and Architecture, and John Milton, Life, Work and Thought. Today, he joins me to talk all about his new book with Oxford University Press, Norse America, The Story of a Founding Myth. So, thanks for joining me today. Would you like to start off by telling us what your book is about? Uh, well, it tells two stories. Um, one story is that of the Norse uh, proceeding uh, in the 10th and 11th century from uh, mainland Scandinavia to the Faroes and Iceland and Greenland. And from Greenland, they sail hunting in many cases to what is now the Eastern Arctic in Canada. And they famously, as we've known since the 1960s, um, had a sort of camp in northern Newfoundland at a site called Lanzo Meadows. So that's one of the stories. The other story is the appropriation of the first story by Canadians and Americans who want to have been discovered um, by, by people with white North European origins rather than by um, Columbus, uh, who was uh, uh, Italian and sailed for Spain and all kinds of other suspicious things. Uh, so there is a racial narrative which is, is potentially pernicious um, in, in the huge attraction of, of having the Norse discover America. And I, I became interested in the attraction as much as I did in, in the actual voyages themselves. Right. How fascinating. Oh, it's a great subject. Yeah. I've never heard of a book that brings those two voyages and those two journeys and those two things together. So that is absolutely awesome. It, it all happened by, by accident. Did it? Um, yeah, in that, well, I, I, I was in Canada in, in the 1960s. So I, I heard about the um, excavations in Newfoundland and, and the discovery of a Norse settlement. And then in the 70s, my first academic job was in, in Denmark. So I, I became interested in, in the, um, the northern world and, and the Norse. But what, what really sort of created the two stories was a, it was a day in, in Reykjavik in Iceland. And uh, I first of all went to the National Museum and a great place and uh, all about Iceland. And not a word about Eric the Red and Life the Lucky and Greenland and uh, and, and discovery of America. And I, I asked a, a curator, you know, nothing on those things. And she said, well, we had an exhibit on Greenlandic clothing about 10 years ago, but there was nothing. And then I left the, uh, the museum and uh, walked into town and there in front of the cathedral, the National Cathedral, is a huge statue of, of Life the Lucky. And I, I couldn't put these two together and I walked around the back of the statue and it said uh, a gift from the people of the United States of America. Wow. And I realized at that point that Americans wanted to be discovered by the Norse, by the Icelanders, rather more than the Icelanders were interested in discovering America. Um, and it, it was that, that, that moment that made me realize there were two narratives here and, and I had to somehow disentangle them. Was that a difficult job to disentangle them or did you find it fairly straightforward? Um, it, it was a it was a surprising job at, at, at several points. Um, there was a, a site in uh, Newfoundland, sorry, in Newfoundland in Greenland, um, which was said uh, to be uh, the farm of Eric Eric the Red, and I dutifully arrived at this and uh, expecting, uh, I don't know, ar archaeological evidence of farming, which there is. Mm -hmm. But there on the hillside is a big statue of Lisa Lucky um, 
erected by was it the the Norwegian Society of of uh, of Seattle, I think it was, and inaugurated with a choir that had flown in, and it it it, it was it was an amazing moment, and I realized there were there was there was serious appropriation going on here, um, but it's of course denied um, by the Columbus people, who rather oddly don't think of Greenland as part of North America. Um, right. And this is a, a yeah. it's a sensitive issue because, I mean, politically, Greenland is an autonomous region of Denmark, but it's at the narrowest point. It's only separated from Canada by 16 miles. Uh, you, you look at a map, any anybody can see that it's it's clearly um, it, it's clearly part of North America. But despite the fact that it was settled for, for hundreds of years by Norse, that somehow doesn't count. Um, and, you know, nothing counts until Columbus sails in 1492. And I thought this is a wonderfully daft story. I, I must I must get a, uh, a noose around it and find a way of telling it. I mean, that's so interesting because I'm pretty sure Norse, um, um, Christopher Columbus didn't actually step foot on North America. Am I correct? Wasn't it only... It, he he denied the existence of of the new world. He insisted till his dying day that he'd reached Asia, and uh, of course he was working in the in the Caribbean and uh, uh, points south. Um, he never envisaged North America. Never he never thought it existed, um, and yet he is the one who was appropriated. Wow. Um, what? It, it's, it, it is very odd, but, but he was appropriated. Once America became independent, they needed um, non-English origins. They somehow needed to push themselves away from, from wicked Britain uh, and a enter Columbus. And he was great for a while because he was deeply un-English. Mm. It, it's all about founding myths. Yeah, founding myths. That's always so fascinating. I mean, founding myths uh, have such a long history as well. Like they just, they come they from. They do. What kind of sources did you use? What, what did you use like evidence? Did you have physical artifacts to, to guide you on this disentangling uh, of stories? Yes, well, there, there's the evidence that people want to adduce are the, the sagas, yeah. um, which, which they persist in reading as log books. Um, so I, I don't assume that there's anything historical in the sagas. I, Eric the Red, I mean, there might have been a chieftain called Eric the Red, but the notion that he had a son called Leif the Lucky seems to me pretty far-fetched. These aren't historical characters, um, but they're treated as such. Um, I mean, in the world of archaeology, if you think of Schliemann's um, interest in the Iliad, and he was sure that there was a true story, and off he went uh, to the coast of Turkey and excavated uh, a site that he thought must be Troy, and he found some burnt wood, and he said, aha, this is it, this is the, the burning of, of the city, and he found various bits of, of, of gold um, and assembled them together and said, this was Priam's treasure, and it, it, it's all made up. It's, it's, it's um, assuming that these ancient fictions are true and then getting evidence to, um, to substantiate it. So there's that kind of evidence. The archaeological evidence, well, particularly in the United States and in, in Maritime Canada, um, is all fake. Uh, in other words, if you're short, if you're short of evidence, you manufacture it. Oh my gosh! So there are there are stones in in written with runic inscriptions on them. Um, the most famous of them is called the Kensington Stone, which was found uh, in 1898 in in rural Minnesota. I've been to see it, and uh, it, it it the inscription. Um, says that in, in 1362, um, a, a group of, of Norsemen uh, and, uh, arrived here and they, they had a, a, a battle and some of them were killed. Um, so it's the image of the, the savage indigenous people versus the, the noble Norse kind of thing. And then they sailed away uh, to, their, to their ships. Um, 
it it it's bogus but there are true believers in in the kensington stone wow. and they show 1362 that's long before columbus um and there are loads of these things um th there are also uh things that are misinterpreted so the um, th th there are um, mounds in, in America in various places. Um, I, the most recent ones I saw were in, in the upper Mississippi. Um, they were made by indigenous people. But the, uh, the myth is that they were made by Vikings because indigenous people are too simple and enter the racist stereotypes uh, to right. have done this kind of thing. Therefore, it must have been a superior civilization. Therefore, it must have been European. Oh and uh, th there's all kinds of, of stuff like that. So the evidence is, uh, is a bit dodgy. And so these, these all this fake, so fake artifacts and then new stories has all been created just to substantiate yep. the tale that they want to believe and that they want to yep. push, basically. That's right. There, there is the, the one licit site um, outside Greenland. The Greenland sites are, are important and, and great fun. Um, but the site that interests people, because it's closer to the United States, mm -hmm. um, yeah. is Lanzo Meadows. Right. Um, so it, it's been recently dated uh, uh, by, by a, indeed, solar flares uh, to mm -hmm. 1021. So it, it was a short-lived settlement, perhaps uh, 10 years, no, no longer. There are three huts uh, for three boat crews. Um, okay. There are no burials. There's no church. Um, it, it's clearly a, a shore station on the way to something. There's, there's um, evidence of metalwork. Um, there are nails made there. So it, it's ship repair. Right. So w why was it there? Well, it, it may, it seems to have been a, a sort of halfway house on on the, the way to a short-lived colony somewhere on the coast of North of mainland North America. Right, so like a way station kind of thing where any repairs yeah, right. need to yeah. be done that, that, or if someone's sick, you just yeah, hang that, out there it, and then you it's Exactly right, on. yes. And uh, after a few years, they, they shut up shop. The, the, there's no evidence of contact there. Right, um, so they're just a um, isolated group. They're all by themselves. But there's three butternut shells, and indeed a bit of carved butternut. Um, now, butternut has never grown in Newfoundland, doesn't grow in Newfoundland now. Wow. It grows in the St. Lawrence Valley in Canada and on the coast of New England, um, at the point where rivers come into the sea, these butternut trees grow. And the currents wouldn't take them, these three butternuts, to Newfoundland. They go in the wrong direction. Um, so somehow um, the Norse acquired um, these three nuts. And the simplest explanation of that is that they were on the North American mainland um, for whatever reason. Maybe a stab. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But that's, that's all the evidence there is. So it's it's not huge. No, it's not huge, but it's also enough to believe that someone travelled from one place to another. Like that's yes. the that's the most logical explanation for the movement of these that's right. nuts. That is precisely so. That is so fascinating. So we don't know where they've come from necessarily on the mainland, nope. or where they've gone necessarily. Nope. But we, we know don't know any of that. that. They've been there. Yep. Wow. Uh, uh, of the artifacts, there, there's one genuine artifact uh, in the States. Um, it's called the Maine Penny, uh, so in the state of Maine. And uh, it, it was discovered uh, in the 1950s, and it's a Norse coin um, from the 10th century. Wow. And wow. Uh, it, it's, it's on an archaeological site that is is arguably the densest site in the world. It, it, something like 30,000 artifacts have been pulled out of it. Huge numbers of arrowheads and that oh. kind of thing. It, it was a Native American site for, um, uh, for centuries. And there is one coin. Now, um, th there's no supporting evidence around it. 
And of course, you can build a fantasy story about how the, the Norse arrived and they, I don't know, traded the coin <laughs> for, for whatever they were after. But there's an interesting thing about the coin, which was in, in I was going to say in the corner, but coins don't normally have corners. On one side, a hole has been drilled. Oh. And that suggests it was a pendant. Um, and other coins would have no value, mm. um, but it was worn as a pendant. And it suggests a trade network that comes down from Labrador, passed from uh, one indigenous group to another. Um, and it ends up in this entirely indigenous site. So it is a real artifact. Wow. Um, wow. But what it doesn't show is that the Norse were there because there's never a, 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 there's never a single artifact in, in archaeology. That is, blows my mind. It's just this one... Yeah one bit one tiny thing yeah and oddly enough it's not on display um which i find amazing the politics of museums are a great mystery um wh when the smithsonian did uh an exhibition in the year 2000 uh about the norse they they got the coin and they displayed it uh, and when i went when I went to see it uh, five or six years ago, they rummaged around in a storeroom and finally came up with it. And it was still in the case that the uh, Smithsonian had sent it back in. So it had never been displayed. Um, so they have, I, it's quite wonderful. They have this one thing that they can <coughs> actually say is legitimately a Norse coin and they don't And it's the display it. only thing. That's right. Yes. That just doesn't, that blows my mind. That doesn't make any sense. You'd think here's, here's our evidence. Yes. Here's the evidence that we have, you know. That's right. That's right. Um, but the, the pro-Norse lobby write about it all the time. Right. But I, I, I don't know why it's not displayed. I, I just work here. <laughs> so people know about it, obviously. They just, yeah. they just don't have it out on display. But they have these right. fake artifacts yeah. on display. Oh, well, they're on display. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, the uh, the last one I saw was in in Nova Scotia, um, where I, I I was a couple of years ago, and it's uh, it it says it's a, a runic inscription. It could be anything. It it looks like gibberish, but it's um, it's it's translated in in various ways. One of which is you know uh, it refers to Leif Erikson, um, and as a result of this. Um, entirely bogus inscription. Um, there is a Leif Erikson trail. I've walked it. Um, and, uh, you know, there are hotels named uh, the Vinland Hotel, that kind of thing. Um, so it, 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 it becomes a part of a, a, a tourist history. Yeah. Um, but again, it feeds in a, in a rather um, sinister way into a history of the province as um, a province for white people. Um, and this is the province that has the oldest black community in Canada. Um, it has a very interesting um, First Nation group there. Um, who, who's, uh, uh, their ethnography is very rich, but they're all written out of the, the tourist history, wow. um, right. which promotes the uh, the Norse, who who are the right color and ethnicity, it's very odd, isn't that it? Is very and, and disturbing. Definitely. Disturbing. Yeah, and then <laughs> yeah, it is disturbing. Um, the uh, because I talk about this kind of thing in the book, it has fallen into the uh, the culture war, mm. um, and uh, I get uh, some people saying, you know, it, it's the greatest thing since the invention of a bread slicer. And other people say it's complete drivel. Uh, it's not true. Columbus was first. Um, and uh, they, they don't trouble themselves with reading the book. That would slow them down rather too much. But uh, uh, they're, they're very firm on this. So anything you write on, on this subject is, is controversial. And I guess writing a book which you've called the, the story of a founding myth with the yes. word myth in the title and then you're yes, looking at these yes, two that, stories you know you're going to get and that's provocative yes you're walking into a to a big battle i guess like i'm sure yes, you, you wrote yes. this knowing that it was not going to be happily received by everyone who reads it and but, but by the time i started writing i had a very clear idea of that yeah um it uh uh i i mean i've written 
there are there are topics like that. I, I wrote a book on the King James Bible, and that ran into the, the history of it, right. uh, and that ran that ran into exactly the same sort of flack. But it's all right. I'm very thick skinned. <laughs> as, as long as you're ready for it, you know you're writing it, and you know oh, yeah. how people are gonna oh, yeah. potentially. No, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'm sure that there are many people that are going to read this book and go, that was fantastic. Like, what a great new way to look yeah. at these things, which... I, I get I get lovely notes from people. Um, it's... Uh, oh, no. And, and the the pros outnumber uh, the, the, the cons, but the cons are noisier. Um, As they usually are. <laughs> and, uh, yes, they, 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 they're great shouters. Yes. Um, I was going to ask about some of the people that you've mentioned in this video, just for people who may not be aware of. Um, so, for example, do you want to just go through who Leif Erikson is, um, Eric the Red, and Leif the Lucky, just a little bit, just so that people... Yeah, know. well, um, uh, Eric the Red um, uh, was the, the, the mythical head of a family who may have existed. Uh, he was not a nice man. Uh, I think we might think of him as a serial killer. Um, he was uh, banished um, repeatedly for, for murder. Uh, he didn't get on with his neighbors very well. And uh, the story in the, in the two um, sagas um, has him uh, being banished for, in the first instance, for, for three years. Um, and uh, he, he goes off to to Greenland and decides that this is what he's going to do so he, he, he sets up a colony there right. and his yeah. son who is either Leif Erikson or Leif Erikson is, is a better pronunciation is is the son of um, and he's also called Lucky um, not because um, he was Lucky but because the 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 characteristic of luckiness is 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 built into him as it were right. um it's not that he enjoyed good luck it's a comment on his on his character okay. whether he existed or not um i i doubt uh but he went off and discovered various places one of which was vinland um and uh, vinland had had wild grapes and self-sown wheat and it was a great place so people have uh, a good time identifying where the real vinland is um and there there are many nominations as as you can imagine um so they're they're the principal characters but the sagos also have um uh, Eric, Eric's wife, uh, who became a Christian, so there's a, a foundations of a church in uh, in Greenland, um, the first church in the New World, uh, that's confidently assigned to his wife, who almost certainly wow. ne never existed, but uh, let's let's not let that hamper us. Uh, and uh, th there are four children, um, and uh, they're all involved in the voyages in various ways. They're great stories. Um, but their relationship to what actually happened is is very uh, is very difficult to to say. You can't tell what shards of memory might be embedded in in any myth. Mm. Um, you, you might suspect that certain things are true, but you know when someone is uh, shot by a uniped a uniped a one legged creature with a bow and arrow. Um, the bow and arrow rings true, but the, the, the one-legged creature seems a bit unlikely. Yes. Um, but that, that's who they are. And in a way, that, well, that story of, of the arrowhead suggests a kind of... Is that evidence of, of contact? Um, the one bit of evidence of contact is an arrowhead. Um, it's now in the National Museum in Denmark. I've been to see it. I'm dutiful in these things. And uh, it was found in a, a, a graveyard in Greenland, a graveyard that, uh, that closed in about 1350. So it's earlier than that. Mm -hmm. And the arrowhead is made of a, a, a kind of quartz and in a style that is... Um, can be pinpointed 
to what is called the Point Revenge culture, one specific spot on the coast of Labrador. Wow. So I, either a, a Norseman, they would go to Labrador, I assume, to collect timber because Greenland doesn't have, doesn't have much in the way of trees. Um, and this Norseman um, may have brought the arrow back in his pocket, but it seems more likely, given uh, where it was found, that it, it came back in his skull. And um, it, 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 it's, it is evidence of contact, but not of a very friendly kind. Oh. Yeah. But that, that, that's who they are. And uh, as with all... They're sort of historical fictions, mm -hmm. and and you, you just can't tell what is true and and what's not. But what there isn't in them is any hard evidence. Sure. I guess when you think about the sagas of Iceland and and all that, you know, you've got someone like the you know the Vikings TV show, you know, very yes, heavily yes. focused based on those sagas, and they go, well, there might have been a, a Bjorn, but it might have been eight different yes. men all named Bjorn and then that's all being converged into one historically yeah, no, legendary no. character. Is it yeah. the same sort of thing where there might have been a bunch of people with these names and they've sort of been converged? Well, into there, may, there, there could have been, but the striking thing is in, in Greenland, um, there's, there's been a lot of good archaeology there. And um, on some of the artifacts, um, names are, are named. Do you name a name? There, there, are, there are names written. And none of the, none of the names on um, artifacts in, in, uncovered by archaeologists in Greenland corresponds to any name in the sagas. Oh. Now, there, there could well one day someone will come up with a piece of wood that, you know, that has the Ferrickson or Eric the Red on it. But at present, there's there's nothing. Wow. Um, I mean, it it is a curious story. The the part that people don't know about is is, is the Greenland colonies um, that lasted for five hundred years. I mean, there are they arrived in about nine eight five. They disappear sometime in the middle of the fifteenth century. Uh, we don't know why, so enter all kinds of, of daft theories. Um, and um, uh, there were two to three thousand people. They spoke a distinctive form of Norse. There was a cathedral, um, a, a vast stone cathedral. Wow. Uh, I visited a par parish church. It has a choir loft. Um, there were services in Latin. And all of this is happening in North America. Um, it, it's, they're, they're, it's, it's not highly sophisticated. They're peasant farmers, but the church is there. There are two monasteries, um, or a monastery and a, and a, a nunnery. Um, it, it's, it, it's a civilized kind of place. And there's no awareness of this, nor any credit given to it. Um, by uh, those that that want the the Norse to have come to to America or indeed Canada, the the, the Greenland is is written off, and I, I that that rather saddens me. It's a it's a wonderful place in in lots of ways. Um, it has interesting Inuit histories and indeed other other. Um, uh, uh, other indigenous groups were there as well. Um, it has a great Norse history, and yet it, there's no awareness of it in the popular imagination. That's so sad. Would you? So do you hope yeah. that this book that you've written sheds the light on Greenland a little bit, just reminding people oh, I do. how I great do. it is and what there is there? Indeed, it. Uh, but it, it's in a way it's cut off. There are no flights from Canada or America to to Greenland. Oh. Um, there are no boats um, that you can. There's no there's no ferry or anything like that. So you have to go either to to Denmark or to to Iceland if you, if you want to go to Greenland. And that means that North Americans can't you know casually go on a holiday, even though you can almost see it from bits of Canada. Um, there, there's no uh, there's, there's no connection between them, and yet uh, there's a wonderfully feisty sign in the um, National Museum in the capital, which is Nuke, uh, that says, um, 
uh, the, these colonists say that Greenland is part of, of Europe. But we, the Inuit, we speak the same language as our cousins across in Canada. Wow. Um, we, we have the same values. We share um, many aspects of our culture. And we are part of North America. So the discoverer of North America, the European discoverer, uh, was was uh, was not Leif the Lucky, um, who simply went you know went to the mainland on a, on a day trip. It was Eric the Red. Uh, now that's the only place I've seen Eric the Red acknowledged. Um, as, but anyhow, it's a, it's a feisty sign, and it's an important one because it's saying we are misconstrued. You are ignoring the indigenous point of view. And the indigenous point of view is a perfectly reasonable and utterly convincing one. Um, it, it, it's not daft at all. I mean, as soon as you read the sign, you know they're right. Um, and th that, that side of it in interests me very much. And that was new to me because I knew very little about Greenland. That is just, that's so fascinating. That kind of blows my mind a bit. This whole, this whole interview has just blown my mind. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's. I, I I find it a, a a very rewarding field to work in. Um, it, uh, it, it some of it is is difficult, but on on the on the on the church side, for example, from from twelve fifty one, uh, they had to pay taxes and tithes. So there's documentation of of the uh, of of the church there. So. Greenland is fairly richly documented, the presence of the Norse is. Um, it, what is not known is when contact with indigenous groups began. And then there's the great mystery of um, why the colony failed and what happened to it. And there are the, you know, the the usual cranks that say, oh, well, they left and then they went to North America and they um, inter intermarried with the locals. Um, I, I, I discovered my own story as part of this because there's a, a little silver um, amulet in, in the National Museum in Greenland and it has a, um, a crest on it and it's a crest of the Campbells from the 14th century. I was able to date it. Wow. So there was a Campbell there, uh, probably as a slave, um, but who was able to work metal, metal and uh, worked this silver. So, and then, and then he or she disappears. So my theory is he or she went to North America, mainland and discovered it and that it was one of my ancestors. And that daft story, which is truly daft, is, is no more daft than the other theories that get spun out of it. Um, but why the Greenland colony disappeared, we, we simply don't know. That's the, the honest answer. Well, what strikes me about the fake artifacts is that um, they often appear in um, areas of Scandinavian settlement. In, in the United States and Canada. Right. In other words, it, they are created to bolster an ethnic identity. And it's interesting, the, the Kensington runestone, for example, that I described, um, which appeared in a, a Scandinavian um, uh, farming community in, in rural, rural Minnesota. Um, Scandinavians are now not hyphenated Americans. They're, they're real Americans. But in the 19th century, they were a marginal group. And they were treated as, as yokels, as simple people by sophisticated New Englanders. Um, so finding a stone that um, somehow showed that they were just as important as those uppity New Englanders was very important for them. Definitely. And that kind of cultural explanation I find very useful. Um, the only artifact I found that didn't have an obvious connection, I say I found, they're all, they're all public, uh, was in Oklahoma. 
um, where there's a, an inscription. Um, it's called the Hevener Rune Stone in a little place called Hevener. And uh, I went over to, to, to see it. And it's it's just one word carved on a on a rock in in runes, and there are no um, Scandinavians there, and I it was the only one I found that wasn't um, the the result of a settlement, and I wondered who had done it, and I noticed that there was a railway at the bottom of the hill, and it turns out that the railway was built by Swedish labourers. Um, and uh, at, the, at the time when the inscription was, was, was added mm. um, in the 19th century. So I had my solution. So it is at, at the level of feeling proud to be Swedish, proud, proud to be Norwegian, it's entirely harmless in, in the same way that family history is, is entirely harmless. But when it hardens into a racial narrative, it gradually becomes more and more sinister. Mm. And it, that hardening process is what is what interested me. Um, often it's not the locals who take it up. The, you know, the farmer who discovered and possibly forged the Kensington runestone, there's no reason to think of him as being anything other than proud of his ancestry. Um, and uh, the, I, it's an important point to make that not all issues of where I come from are sinister, but they can be turned to sinister purpose mm -hmm. um, by okay. those who think in terms of race and racial distinction and racial superiority. Um, and that, that, was the, the, that was a lesson I learned when, when researching the book uh, and one I'm glad to have learned. Brilliant. It sounds like it's going to be a brilliant book, um, and it's going to rock the rock the popular view of of America and the history of America and the beliefs of Columbus versus the Norsemen. Well, well, I I I simply want it to feed into the argument. Um, it. Uh, it is, as you say, a, an argument that that hasn't been made before. Um, there, you know, there, there may be faults in it, uh, and the only way people can find out is is to read it. Um, but it, it it certainly interested me. I had a great time writing it, and it came with some some really good travelling. Um, and I hope people have a good time reading it. I'm sure they will. And maybe this is just the beginning of this new discussion in this new point of view as well that would be lovely if it were the case well thank you very much i share your hope good i'm glad well thank you so much for joining me today um and we will link your book down below so if anyone wants to purchase it they will be able to okay you're very kind thank you very much this video was brought to you by world history encyclopedia for more great articles and interactive content head to our website via the link below if you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more on our shop at worldhistory.store or you can find a link for it down below under the merch tab. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.